food that you're gonna eat today, we're gonna be served lunch, right? And if you think that uh, your food is going to contain uh, plant products, raise your hand. Anything made from crops you're gonna eat today. I see, I see a lot of hands, you know, and uh, that's not surprising because plants are the foundation of our nutrition. And um, if we two gather in this theater next year and eat exactly the same food, uh, made from crops grown in exactly the same conditions, then it will be slightly less nutritious. And the year after that, it will be even less nutritious. And that trend of declining food quality will continue for decades, affecting not only our nutrition, but also of our children. And when I say that crops will be grown in exactly the same conditions, that's not exactly true. Because CO2 concentrations, carbon dioxide concentrations, next year will be slightly higher, primarily because we burn fossil fuels. And uh, I'll be linking that increase in CO2 to drop in minerals, such as calcium, magnesium, potassium, and zinc. And uh, you know, our bodies uh, can make minerals. We have to get them from our food. And uh, these minerals, you know, they, they, they keep our immune system and bones strong and our brain and heart healthy. And, uh, you know, a lot of the food is plants, like rice and wheat uh, provide about 40% calories worldwide, but not enough nutrients. For example, zinc, zinc deficiency uh, affects about 1 billion people worldwide, and new estimates show that calcium deficiency affects 3.5 billion people, every other person on Earth. And uh, prospective mothers, they sometimes don't get enough iron, and that affects not only them, but also their babies. And you know, knowing that food quality is declining is not good news. And uh, uh, you might be skeptical, not believe me, and you're certainly not alone. Uh, there were many scientists that were also skeptical of my claims. And <clears throat> I'll share with you some of the challenges of proving that it's true, and I also hope that uh, I'll convince you along the way. Now, I never really thought that uh, I'm gonna work on nutrition. I was growing up as a, a mathematician, to be a mathematician in the Soviet Georgia, and the program was very rigorous, it was mostly math classes. I did have passion for ecology, but couldn't really take uh, classes uh, in ecology, but was reading some books on my own. But then my mathematics studies get interrupted. I get drafted to this uh, military service. I'm sent to the secretive military base, highly guarded in Lithuania. They have these nuclear warheads underground, and above it, just a green pasture and a lake and cows. And uh, I'm assigned to be a guard. And reading these ecology textbooks, I learned that um, that ecologists call grass or any type of green plant as uh, producers because they use the energy of sunlight and CO2 to make starch and sugars. This, this is the world's factory of carbohydrates. They also take minerals from you know, the soil and water to make organic matter, our food. They produce food, that's why they're producers. And those that consume them, like cows or us, are consumers. And so there was a cow taker position. So I applied and got it. And all I had to do is take care of cows. No guarding. And uh, I had to milk them twice a day. But the irony of the Soviet Union is that they had the sophisticated military equipment, but no milking machine. So I had to milk cows twice a day with my hands. I still remember how to do that. <laughs> and uh, I noticed that the amount of milk I get from each cow, you know, as I was doing it manually, depended not only on amount of grass they ate, but also its quality. And that was interesting because, according to traditional ecological theory, uh, you know, it was mostly focusing on food quantity and on food quality. And then, uh, uh, you know, once I finish my studies and my service, the Soviet Union collapses, and um, a lot of stuff becomes worthless, like money and the textbooks filled with 
you know, history, ideology-based stuff. But one thing holds its value in its mathematics. Fortunately for me, because that's what I learned. Because it's mathematics transcends all the boundaries, political boundaries and geographical boundaries. Mathematical equation in the Soviet Union works the same way as in America or here. And so this allows me to come to uh, Arizona State University uh, and continue my studies in math. But I'm allowed to take courses in ecology, and there I learn about these really interesting experiments. So they grow this algae, phytoplankton, in those uh, flasks. These are producers also. And they put different amount of light on them. And of course, the more light you put, you know, the more producers you get. And then they feed that to zooplankton. And now you would think more light, more food, more zooplankton. That happened up to a point. When there was a lot of light, you had a lot of food, but zooplankton eating all that food did really bad. In fact, one of the experiments just died. And the explanation the ecologists gave was really neat. You see, the amount of mineral phosphorus in those flasks was limited, just as it is in real lakes and oceans. And so when you put a lot of light, these things get a lot of carbon, but not enough phosphorus. I mean, enough for them, but not for the zooplankton. So zooplankton was getting poor quality food. So for my PhD thesis, I focused on making a simple model, mathematical model, that will capture that effect. And, uh, and so, you know, one equation describes producers, another uh, consumers. And, you know, the beauty about mathematics is that uh, it, it, it crosses not just geographical boundaries, but species boundaries. If something is true, you know, and, and nothing in those equations was specific to plankton, uh, then, then it should be also true for other species. So for my postdoctoral work, I moved to Princeton University and started to think, well, uh, they use light and CO2, right? And uh, when we increase light, photosynthesis goes up. But we're not really increasing, you know, we're not making our sun brighter, but we do increase CO2 concentrations. And by the way, this is CO2 concentrations at the time. 371 parts per million, and of course increasing every year. So I'm thinking, huh, what if that increase in CO2 can affect our food? And then us, right? So this uh, mathematics allows me to make this kind of transfer, you know, parallel from, from this plankton system to uh, crops and humans by replacing light with CO2. And I published that, published that in a, in a top ecological journal and make this logical argument and I am in a top university and I naively think, okay, I kind of show and prove that. But uh, um, ecologists, you know, they, they, they want evidence and we didn't really have evidence, very few data. And ecologists actually do raise plants at elevated CO2 and they measure um, you know, they measure their growth and yield, and sometimes they measure minerals, but, you know, it's like measuring uh, weather three times in Bratislava. Are you going to detect global warming? No, right? You need a lot of data, and we didn't have them. So I thought maybe, you know, could generate data, but everything went downhill. So I moved to Nebraska. It's a crop state for my faculty position, and uh, it's a mathematics department. So uh, I applied to the mathematics division at National Science Foundation to generate more sophisticated mathematical model. And they tell me, yeah, you have too much biology there. We don't really fund that. Go apply to biology division. So I come up with the really, I think, a neat idea. Uh, I write to these uh, uh, directors of uh, centers that raise plants at elevated CO2. And I say, share samples with me. So I'll pull all these samples, and then we'll analyze them. And they agree. They agree in writing. They say, sure, we'll uh, share samples with you. I put all these letters and apply to the biology division. And um, they tell me, 
right? Go somewhere else, essentially. And I do. I apply to, I apply to other places. And for one or another reason, get rejected. It's a cross-disciplinary uh, proposal. It doesn't really fit anywhere. And then Great Recession happens. And so, you know, uh, my department wants to save money, and I'm not bringing any money, any grants, so they cut me. I become unemployed. And I take my grant proposal and post online so somebody maybe who has money could generate data. But along the way, here's what I do. Instead of pulling plant samples, which I don't have, I pull data from the literature. Little bit and by little bit, they publish the data on minerals. And so I accumulate them. I don't have enough. And by 2011, I actually ran out of my savings. So I applied to government for food assistance. And they misspelled my name, but they actually give me this time. They approve. They give me $200. <laughs> so I have to buy cheaper food for my family. And when I start to buy cheaper food, I see it has more sugar in it. And I'm like, wow, this big food industry injects sugar in our food supply because it's very cheap for them to do. And then I have, at the time, enough data to actually see that CO2, rising CO2 does the same. It injects more starchy sugars and minerals drop. And I'll tell you something weird. I felt at the time that I was the only like, person in the world who knew that's happening. And the reason why, and probably I was, because next year, ecologists published this paper. And they say, you know what? We also pull data. And there's no effect. There's no change in grain quality. In fact, if you look, say, at the grasses and zinc, it actually increases. Well, I say, that can be true, right? I look at their sample size. Their sample size is two. They essentially sell noise for actual signal. And then their data contains so many errors that, to their credit, three years later, they retract their study. They cancel it. But at the time, that was the last word. It affected the International Panel on Climate Change that in their fifth assessment said, you know, CO2 doesn't really change uh, crop quality. So I thought, OK, I have to publish it. It took me two years uh, for peer review. And then I published this paper. And it's called, uh, I called Hidden Shift for two reasons. First, when you look at your food, right, you can't really see the quality is lower. Second, if you have a small sample, you can't see. You have to have massive amount of data. And the ionome refers here to all these minerals, OK? So all these minerals that we get from food. So, Thanks to all these researchers that were you know, uh, on four continents raising these plants at elevated CO2, uh, my data set covered 15,000 more, 15,000 observations and 130 plant uh, varieties. So it was such a massive data set that it cut through the noise and showed the signal. And here are what happens. Carbon increases in plants. And all these minerals, calcium, magnesium, and zinc, and iron, they decline. Now, if we look at, at crops, major crops, uh, for which we have data, we also see that minerals decline in all major crops. Now, that effect actually is global. If you look at different latitudes, you could see it's in temperate regions, and it is in, in tropical regions. And for all the countries for which we have enough data, that also happens there. Now, what about type of experiment, right? Some raise it in, in greenhouses. They elevate CO2. Some do it in open fields, where there's continuously pump CO2 concentrations. Well, if you look at that, in both experiments, minerals decline. What about wild plants? Does this just happen to, to crops? Well, if you look at that, it turns out it happens in wild plants as well, and crops. And it happens to little plants and big trees. So the evidence was so compelling that the next year, the US government calls me and says, you know, we're writing this report about climate change impacts on human health. And can you help us? I said, sure. So uh, in 2016, they produced a report with its key finding one of its key findings is that rising CO2 lowers food quality. And it's one of the only very few key findings that is uh, of high confidence, very likely to happen. 
couple of months later, I received a letter from the White House, from the executive office of the president. So the US government that was declining all my grants all these years now thanks me for the service uh, to the nation. And uh, what was more pleasing that uh, America became the first industrialized country that um, acknowledged that effect. Now, that decline in, in you know, crop quality and minerals, this minerals decline like 5 or 10 percent, might not sound as big, right? But think of it, every time you're going to eat food for the rest of your life, all these minerals and protein will be replaced with carbohydrates, empty calories. And you know, I thought, I thought I have this effective ending for my talk. I thought that this uh, cumulative effect of extra carbs would be maybe like a bucket, you know? And I thought I'm gonna dump this bucket on me, you know, let's just show you that. <laughs> but, but when I actually did the uh, calculations, I realized I better not do it, because if I'm gonna dump all the amount on me at once, it will kill me instantly. So this is the amount of extra carbs we'll consume. Instead of uh, minerals and protein, over our lifetime, as CO2 concentrations uh, rise. And you know, they give advice, finish at a TED talk with call for action. But, you know, I am, uh, I'm not a policymaker, I'm not comfortable giving people advice. I am a scientist, I usually answer questions or raise new questions. So I want to finish this talk by um, raising this question. How much these extra carbs and sugars we consume, these empty calories, because of rising CO2, are going to affect diabetes and obesity that is rising worldwide? Now, we don't know the um, answer to this question. But I do hope those people that try to answer it won't have to go through multi-year problems I went through and will get the answer sooner. So thank you very much. <laughs>